Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Sporting Max. Today's guest is the founder and CEO of the luxury concierge service Bluefish, Steve Sims. Steve grew up in uh, East London and just recently received his citizenship to, to the United States. Welcome to the podcast, Steve. It's an absolute honour to have you on. How are you going? Oh, the pleasure is mine. Pleased to meet you, man. Oh, it's awesome to meet you too. Now, can you tell me a bit about your childhood and what growing up in East London was like for you? Uh, it's funny how you, you, you kind of change your perspective, but mm -hmm. if you asked me that question when I was 19 years old, I would have said I was very poor. I was very bitter. I was very angry. I was doing jobs that were very rough. So it mm -hmm. was, um, I won't say it was a dark yep. kind of, of, of childhood, but it, it wasn't privileged. There was no private school. In fact, here's a funny thing that'll make you laugh. Uh, it wasn't until I was 18 years old that we had our first ever takeaway food. Wow. We, yeah, so here in America, you, you, you just have pizzas, Chinese, yeah. Indian food. You don't think about it, but we never had that because we couldn't afford outside prices. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very bitter growing up, and I thought it was very bad. And as I say, the key is if you'd have asked me if I was 19 mm -hmm. or when I was 19. When I hit my early 20s and my enthusiasm was getting me into different positions, different people, different networks, mm -hmm. I suddenly realized that I was never hungry. There was never a night I wasn't tucked into bed. Um, mm -hmm. The lights would always go on. The water would always come. So while I didn't have a lot of money, I was very secure, very safe, very yeah. loved, very nurtured. So... It was, it was fortunate for me in my early 20s mm -hmm. to realize that I had actually been empowered with a ton of lessons of how to work hard. Yep. And, it, and in an environment today where people are looking to make the most amount of money by the least amount of work, <laughs> yep. you get people like me that go, hey, I still want to make the most amount of money, but I'm, I'm completely okay with putting the hours in. Yep. I'm okay about getting up at four o'clock in the morning to do a podcast with Korea or yeah. to stay on the phone at 11 o'clock at night because you're trying to get a client in Australia. <laughs> None of that phases me because and hard work compared mm -hmm. to what me, my father, my grandparents, you know, what they did. So I'm very fortunate. Now you dropped out of school um, at 15 and went working with your family as a bricklayer. How does a 15-year-old drop out and wind up where you are now? Um, well, I dropped out because school wasn't interesting me. It wasn't mm -hmm. captivating me. You know, I remember one day getting in trouble at school and mm -hmm. I got the cane. Uh, this was back in the days where you had to <laughs> hold your hand out yeah. and you got a cane three times across the, the palm of your hand. And it hurt. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I remember the first time I, uh, I got the first lash and I wanted to cry. It hurt. Mm -hmm. But just before he hit me the second time, he said to me, Sims, you're nothing more than a hustler. And mm -hmm. the funny thing is, in my head, something clicked. I thought yeah. to myself, why is that a bad thing? Yeah. <laughs> you know, why, is, why is hustling a negative? Yeah. You know, surely you want people to be looking hustling for... Hustling, yeah. Yeah. If someone comes into a job today and says, hey, I'll tell you now, mate, I am the biggest hustler you'll ever meet. You're going to want me on your side. People are going to take gonna you. employ them. Yeah. yeah. But back then it was a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I left school, there was just nothing it could do for me. I was scraping through. I would yeah. pay no attention to tests. Then I would get told, mm -hmm. hey, if you don't buck up, you're going to fail. Yeah. I'd spend a bit of enthusiasm, scrape through on a D, and that'd be good enough, you know? <laughs> because yeah. for me, who cared, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then when I came out of school, of course, we didn't have Instagram, Facebook. We didn't yeah. have any of these social platforms to show me visually how inadequate my life was. Mm -hmm. I just realized deep inside, hey, there's got to be something out there for me. There's yeah. got to be something better. It ain't school. It isn't this building site. There's got to be. And the funny thing is, no matter what entrepreneur you speak to, mm -hmm. they all start from a point of aggravation. 
they all start from that point where they go, well, hang on a minute. Why are we doing it like this? We should be doing it like this. Yeah. That's you. That's what, yeah. that's why Max at your age, mm -hmm. you can have a conversation with me, 55 mm -hmm. years old <laughs> from another side of the planet. <laughs> and we share something similar. That's yeah. the beauty about entrepreneurs. We're aggravated. We're dominators. We feel as though we don't fit in mm -hmm. until we realize that we were never built to. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what happened at the age of 15. I was aggravated to try and find something different. Mm -hmm. I failed a lot, but I allowed the failure to refine me rather than define me. Mm -hmm. And then I just carried on going until I started to get some kind of momentum, mm -hmm. some kind of traction. But my, my core goal, I, I, I move with one reason. I, anything yeah. I'm ever going to do, I have one goal. And my goal when I was younger was I want to meet someone rich mm -hmm. and I want to ask them, why are you rich and I'm not? Yeah. You know, I don't mind getting up at 4.30 in the morning. I don't mind going to bed at midnight. So I'm happy to put the hours in. Mm -hmm. Hey, I don't cry when I get smacked. I don't cry when I fall over. So I'm okay with hard work. But why are you making a fortune out of it and I'm not? And that yeah. was my goal. And so... I ended up needed just so I could get into that world and mm -hmm. ask him that question. And I went from a bricklayer to ending up being this like concierge to billionaires mm -hmm. to now in marketing and branding for some of the biggest companies in the planet and some of the smallest entrepreneurs in the planet. So it's been a beautiful journey. You met your wife, Claire, uh, when you were 16 years old and have three children. What were these years like for you um, of starting a family and growing and raising a family? I'm not sure if there's anything more difficult than raising a family um, yeah. because kids don't come with a manual. Um, no. <laughs> and and they're, all, they're all bloody different. Uh, I, mm -hmm. you know, I got three kids. Yeah, I know that from us. Mm -hmm. But they're three completely different people. So <laughs> it's very, very strange. Uh, it's very heart-wrenching. It's very upsetting. It's also very rewarding when it goes right. Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't know. We didn't know anything. Yeah. And the funny thing is, a lot of people today, they want to start a new job. They want to start a new project. They want to start something. Mm -hmm. And the first thing they do is they sit down and they start making out plans. Yeah. And they start working out, you know, their assets. They start working out their finances. They start working out what they need. They start working out their marketing budgets. There's all this planning and preparation mm -hmm. that comes out. Okay. There's not a single business plan that was written in 2019 wow. that says we're going to come out with a brilliant idea and then come yep. March 2020, we're going to be screwed for a year mm -hmm. because of the world's <laughs> first pandemic. No one knows these things. I always say that if your business plan can be written on anything bigger than a postcard, mm -hmm. it's too big. Yeah. Because you don't know what's happening next month. Mm -hmm. You don't know what's happening next year. You don't know what's happening in five years time. So I believe that there's a concept of get going, then get good. So mm -hmm. my life has been, hey, I'm going to try this. I start it something goes wrong and I go, well, okay, great. I now know what's mm -hmm. wrong. Like me and you are talking now on a podcast. Yeah. I, I have a podcast called the art of making things happen. Yeah. And I can guarantee you, Max, the first time you did a podcast, it was horrible. Yes, it was. <laughs> because every time an entrepreneur does something the first time is okay. terrible yeah. compared to what it's going to be 12 months later. Mm -hmm. Now, when you realize that the first time you do anything is going to be rubbish, yeah. it allows you permission to just try different things because mm -hmm. you're no longer going for perfection the first time. You're giving yep. yourself permission to try. I remember my first podcast, I had a bad microphone. Um, I didn't know how to have a conversation. I didn't mm -hmm. know how to host a show. I didn't know how to upload it. Um, and I remember we did, we did 18 shows because a friend of mm -hmm. mine said, record a block of shows mm -hmm. and then release them at the same time. 
that yeah. that'd be a good way to do it. Um, I released, I uh, we did eighteen shows. We kept the last three. Mm -hmm. The first fifteen was so appalling <laughs> that we were like, "I am never releasing those." <laughs> now, here's the funny thing: we thought the last three were pretty good mm -hmm. until eighty shows later. You realize the first three were just as bad. <laughs> um, but the first ones that we burnt and hid, mm -hmm. I don't even want to. I don't even want to wonder what they sounded like. Yeah, they must have been terrible. So my point is that I believe that when you give your permit, you give yourself permission to be bad at something, mm -hmm. it allows you to try so many different things. Yeah, so absolutely. When, when you know it's going to be bad, when you know it's going to be rough, and you're fine with that, mm -hmm. that's a good place to be. Now you worked uh, as a stockbroker in London, um, and um, for a few months before transferring to Hong Kong, not even lasting a week. Uh, what happened here? So I got away with it a bit in England because mm -hmm. there were a lot of people. And when I landed in Hong Kong, I lasted one day. Um, <laughs> I, I'm no good with money. Mm -hmm. I'm no good with figures. I'm no, whenever someone says to me, oh, let's do this and plan it, mm -hmm. I grab my phone for the calculator. And nine times out of 10, instead of actually calculating it myself, <laughs> I phone up my financial person and say, right, get over here. We're doing some planning. <laughs> and I, bring them in. I, I think one of the first good things about any entrepreneur is to realize what you're not good at mm -hmm. and then ignore it. Yeah. You know, when you realize you're not good at marketing, hire someone to do your marketing. When you're <laughs> not good. See, I, I, I believe now I'm okay as a host on a podcast. Yeah. Okay but I don't want to edit it. I don't want to upload it. I don't want to spice it. I don't want to equalize the video. I don't want to mm -hmm. do any of that. <laughs> so I employ people to do it. So mm -hmm. that was the thing that was really clever for me. I realized, hey, what I'm not very good at, give it to someone else. Mm -hmm. Stockbroking world, I wanted the job because as a stockbroker, your clients were rich. Yeah. So you had my clients, but I couldn't do the job. So I had to find another way of getting rich clients. I believe you stayed in uh, Hong Kong and worked security. How did this experience uh, and how did you find that experience and where, and is that where the idea of starting a concierge company came about? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you say security, that's more glamorous than it actually was. Um, mm -hmm. I was... I was trying to get a job. I'd been fired from the stockbroker's position. I was mm -hmm. trying to get a job in Hong Kong. No one would take me. I'm a big, ugly fella. For people that can't <laughs> see this. Um, and built me to be a little bit scary and intimidating. Mm -hmm. And so I'm at this night, I'm at this bar in Hong Kong, and it was not a nice place. You know? <laughs> it sold cheap whiskey. And mm -hmm. that's why I was there. And I was upset. I was angry. Um, and I couldn't get a job. And I'm sitting outside this bar, basically just drinking myself stupid. I was, I had a lot of pity. I had mm -hmm. a lot of uh, um, sadness. I was not in a good mental position. Yep. And the lady that owned the bar asked me to be the doorman. <laughs> and she said, if, you, if you're the door, you're big and ugly. That, I remember her saying to me, she <laughs> said, you're big and ugly. If you work on the door, I'll pay for your drinks. Mm -hmm. So it was a way of me actually not having to pay my tab and have a yeah. job. So I took what I openly thought was the lowest point of my life. Mm -hmm. I thought this was the lowest job I possibly get. Mm -hmm. Because there's no skill in being a doorman. <laughs> you've got to look scary and you've got to be okay with being in fights. Mm -hmm. That was my job description at the time. So I took the job um, and then something funny happened. I realized standing on the door of a, a club and a bar, I got to watch people. Mm -hmm. I got to watch how they acted. I got to see how poor people, because I was poor, Mm -hmm. how poor people pretend to be rich. 
And I got to see how rich people get to pretend to be richer. And then I got to see how the really rich people acted poor. You know, it was really, <laughs> well, if you look, if you look at Mark Zuckerberg, mm -hmm. Steve Jobs, these people look as though they're poor. Yeah, Mark Zuckerberg openly says that he buys all of his clothes from Gap. <laughs> so it's very strange how people are, how they think, how they connect with each other. And it became a great education for me. And from there, I got to deal with people who pretended to be rich. And I got to speak with people that were rich. Mm -hmm. And that's where it started. I realized that I needed to see how I could help these people. And so I started getting them into parties, into clubs. At the early stage, I was a good doorman. So yep. I got to be the doorman of some pretty good parties. And I would bring these wealthy people in as my yep. guests and mm -hmm. get them to talk to me. I didn't do it at the beginning to make money. Mm -hmm. I did it at the beginning to increase my connections. Yeah. Um, and it worked well for me. So what were those first few years um, of getting um, Bluefish sort of off the ground like? Um, that's a very good question, Max, and a very weird one. Because I wasn't trying to get Bluefish off the ground. Mm -hmm. People have to understand where did Bluefish come from. I started throwing my own parties, and I started giving people passwords. And one of the yeah. passwords was Bluefish. So we hadn't put any thought into it. I never thought this would blow it up into a big concierge. You see, my yeah. concierge, my company ended up being the company that sent people down to see the Titanic, yeah. sent them up into space. They used to walk the red carpet of every award show in the world. <laughs> they used to go to the Monaco Grand Prix, the Paris Fashion Week, mm -hmm. Sir John's Oscar party. I never expected this to last past the first party. Mm -hmm. And then when I threw a second party, I thought, well, that'd be the last party. Six months later, and I'm taking over mansions and yachts and <laughs> penthouses and thinking, well, I won't be doing this anymore. So I never, ever thought it mm -hmm. would be anything. In fact, quite openly, I used to say to my wife, look, I'm building up a network so I mm -hmm. can go to my network and get a job. Yep. And it wasn't until about seven years later that I still thought that, that my, my, my wife said, you have a job. You just built it yourself. And I was <laughs> like, yeah, I did. And we had never realized. You see, sometimes mm -hmm. you can get so focused at the tree, mm -hmm. you fail to realize you're in a forest. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened to me. I was so focused on building up connections with rich people, I hadn't realized I'd actually built up my own industry. In yeah. fact, <laughs> we launched the world's first concierge firm and I'm going to arrogantly say, and I will challenge anyone to deny it, my company was the instigator mm -hmm. for, the, for, the, for the private concierge industry that it is now. Um, now, I've read that you've made like, the most extraordinary things happen. Um, for example, a private dinner for six at the feet of Michelangelo's David, um, dinners in Italy by, uh, while be being serenaded by Andrea Bocelli. Um, and underwater tours um, of the Titanic. Can you tell me about these sort of experiences and how you've made them happen? Um, wealthy people don't want watches. Mm -hmm. They want experiences. They want stories. They want memories. They want emotions. I learned that very early on, okay? Anyone mm -hmm. can get a Ferrari. If you've got half-decent credit, you can get a Ferrari, okay? Yep but you can't close down a museum in Florence and have a dinner party with Andrea Bocelli. Mm -hmm. So I realized that I was, there were two things that I had. One, I had a stupid imagination. Mm -hmm. You know, I would imagine these incredible experiences mm -hmm. and as long as you could afford them, I would make them happen. Yeah. Two, I was ignorant, okay? Mm -hmm. And ignorance is a good thing, you see? As you get older, and I'm telling you this, Max, mm -hmm. people are going to impose their own fears on you. Yep. They're going to say to you things like, hey, Max, you could never get Steve Sims on your podcast. Yeah. <laughs> you, could, you could never do this. You're never going to be a, you're a good lad, 
-hmm. but you're never going to be able to do this. Yeah. And what you'll recognize is the people that are telling you it can't be done are scared that you're going to do it and mm -hmm. prove them inadequate to be able to. Yeah. Okay. And so I started looking at the people. Why can't I do it? Just because mm -hmm. you can't. Yeah. Why can't I? So I was ignorant to it ever going wrong. Yeah. Uh, and even when it did go wrong, I'd be like, oh, well, what else can I do that's better? You know? <laughs> yeah. And so I was very ignorant to uh, being turned down and declined. Mm -hmm. And so I kept on trying different things. And uh, it worked. Uh, yeah. The more I tried, the more it worked. Um, and I ended up pulling off things like closing down museums and mm -hmm. working with Sorrel and John and working with... I've been in rooms mm -hmm. that are my events with Jean-Paul Dujoria, the head of Paul Mitchell, with Richard Branson, mm -hmm. with Elon Musk, with Paul McCartney. And I've been stood there and I've gone, huh, how did I pull this off? <laughs> and it's even surprised me, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. But I never stopped going mm -hmm. until I achieved it. And then I'd be like, wow, I can't believe I did this. Yeah. And so, and so that was the way it went. I just kept on going and going and going until I achieved. Now, you mentioned before that um, Bluefish was named as the sort of new concierge, um, the official concierge of the New York Fashion Week. You guys also did the LA Fashion Week. What did those two sort of events mean to you? <laughs> so, I laugh because the New York Fashion Week was – um, the biggest fashion event in North America. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the pinnacles. Got the New York Fashion Week, the London Fashion Week, Paris, Milan. Yeah. Those are the big ones. And mm -hmm. then you've got smaller ones. Like, at no disrespect, but most cities have a fashion week. Mm -hmm. But the Minas, the, uh, um, I know, the New Orleans Fashion Week is never going to compare to the to yeah. Paris Fashion Week um, yep. and the uh, the Indian Fashion Week. You know, just the, every country and every city has a Fashion Week, mm -hmm. um, but those were the big ones. And when I got the New York Fashion Week, I was quite excited mm -hmm. <laughs> and, until I realised how much ego mm -hmm. is in that tent. It used to be in the Bryant Park tent in New York and... moves the planet mm -hmm. they think without fashion the world will stop <laughs> and, and that kind of made me laugh because if anyone's ever met me i got a black t-shirt on jeans i'm in a black t-shirt and jeans now mm -hmm. i only have black t-shirts yeah okay you know mm -hmm. i don't care what the color of this year is i don't <laughs> care uh of any but the models thought they were something special. Mm -hmm. They looked as though like the last 15 years of their life. <laughs> and most of them were only 15. You know, mm -hmm. they were very young girls that were wrapped up just in how they looked. Yeah. And then they were next to a fashion designer who literally thought they were godlike <laughs> in an environment where everyone's cheering at them. It was a very mm -hmm. harsh environment and so we were the official concierge for the new york fashion week which was um was interesting revealing and funny because i didn't take <laughs> it seriously yeah and then we got asked to look after the la fashion week which was a joke mm -hmm. it was basically you know sequined jeans and torn up t-shirts it was <laughs> how can i take something that looks as though you'd lived on the street Mm -hmm. and pretend as though it was fashion mm -hmm. and charge you $500. Yeah. It was, it was such a mishmash of eagle um, dysfunction. Just for, I think, a couple of shows. And we were like, that is stupid. Mm -hmm. And we were out of that. Um, can you name some of the most famous people uh, who you've worked with? Elon Musk, Sir Elton mm -hmm. John, Richard Branson, Andrea wow. Michelli, the Pope, mm -hmm. you know, there's a few. 
Um, I've read you've done some things um, with people like Elon Musk, like you just mentioned. What's it like to get to know him and I guess know I'm um, sort of a fraction of his mind? Bear in mind, the only reason I do anything is to get into the room of that person. Mm -hmm. Okay. I wanted to have a conversation. I've only had a couple of conversations with Elon, mm -hmm. um, but he thinks differently. He thinks mm -hmm. differently. Yeah. He talks differently. Richard Branson talks and thinks differently. Jean-Paul de Jouria, Steve Jobs. The beautiful thing is, if you can have a conversation with these people, mm -hmm. it changes the way you look at things. Yeah. So you change the person that you are walking into the room mm -hmm. as to the person you are when you leave it. And every time I have a conversation with someone who thinks differently and does differently, it changes the way I think and the way I do. Yeah. Uh, you've had the privilege um, and honour of, of speaking and presenting at Harvard twice now. Can you take me through the experience uh, of presenting there? Uh, surreal. Um, mm -hmm. I remember the first time I got asked to speak at Harvard. True story. I thought someone was winding me up. You know, <laughs> I, I got a phone call from a girl at Harvard asking me to present and lecture. And I thought, don't be silly. You know, <laughs> you're having, this is someone joking. Yeah. And I was, I was a little bit rude mm -hmm. because I thought someone was trying to wind me up. Mm -hmm. um, and I hung up on them. Wow. I literally <laughs> hung up on them. I thought, ah, it's not funny. Click and I hang up. And they called back. Um, and then I realized it was actually Harvard. And I was yeah. like, wow. So, but, and here's the funny thing. I said to him, is there a dress code? Mm -hmm. So that's good. So I turned <laughs> up in my t-shirt and jeans. And there wasn't a single person in that room that didn't have a jacket on. Oh, no. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, your idea of casual to my idea of casual. It's completely different. Two different things. Yeah. So that was quite funny. Um, and I thought, well, this is good. I spoke at Harvard. I got the mug. I got the T-shirt. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think it was about two or three years later, they asked me to come back. And I'm like, are you, you, come back? <laughs> do, you do you remember the first time I was there? Mm -hmm. um, but it happened. I went back and I spoke at Harvard a, a second time. And it was, it was very amazing. It was very intimidating, mm -hmm. scary, funny that I'm up there. And I was up there at the time, Jim, uh, and they were one of the senior board directors mm -hmm. of Goldman Sachs, uh, Toomey, Waterworks, and Tiffany. Wow. And, uh, and me. And I'm thinking, <laughs> this is funny because all the other people, they had been to Harvard or Wharton yep. or Stanford. I hadn't. I had never, I had never done it. I had left school at 15. Mm -hmm. That was it. And yeah. here I am lecturing at Harvard. So it was pretty cool. Uh, your book titled Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen was published in uh, 2017. Can you elaborate um, on the entire experience of writing a book and what it means to you and how long the book took to write? So, yeah, the, so the book, I was offered the chance to write a book. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, I was paid. Yeah. Now, the reason that this is an important thing to understand is that when you write a book, you're either paid to write it or you're paid when people buy it. Yeah. When people buy a book, if you don't have any other job, now bear in mind, I had the concierge firm. So yeah. if my book died, I didn't care. My lights were still on. Yeah. Um, I was paid to write the book as well, mm -hmm. I thought to myself, I've got no liability. Yeah. I can literally release the book that I want to write, that yeah. I care about, yeah. that I want to speak. So I didn't care if it sold. Yeah. <laughs> I cared that it was true to my belief, mm -hmm. true to my standards. Beautiful position for an author to be in. A lot of authors sell books to get speaking engagements and coaching mm -hmm. deals and yeah. endorsement. I didn't care. I just wanted to write the book that I wanted to write. So when it was released, I literally thought, this isn't going to sell. No yeah. one's going to believe <laughs> it. 
you know, I'm telling people to go left when everyone's going right. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get you to do different things. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to believe it. So for the first couple of months, it didn't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it sold a handful of copies. And I'm like, oh, oh, month, I remember this. It got picked up. Mm -hmm. And people started contacting me going, my God, you wrote this, but is this true? You know, <laughs> can believe it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where it took off. And I didn't know it would do well, but it's become a bestseller. And it's been written in, um, it's been released in China, uh, China, Taiwan, Korea, Thailand, Vietnam, Poland. Yeah. Um, it sold out all of its copies in Poland in two wow. hours of being released. <laughs> um, and now at the moment it's being translated into Russian mm -hmm. and it's being released, uh, released in Russian. And you can get it an audio version. I read the audio version. So it's, yep. it's me on that version. It was very scary because it's like, it's like mm -hmm. building Frankenstein. Yeah. Okay. You build it, you let it go out the door Mm -hmm. And then you no longer control it. And everything you've done, <laughs> you're out of control. I've had people, I've had people yell at me going, hey, my entire business was and this business I stopped mm -hmm. because of you. You know, it's just <laughs> people have had all these reactions. I've mm -hmm. had people say to me, me and my husband split up because of you. And I'm like, wow. how? And they went, we realized that we weren't communicating. We weren't connecting. We weren't relating. So we just decided we're going to call it quits. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And then I've had people saying, oh, I gave this to my kid. Look at you, Max. Yeah. You've contacted. I'm connecting with you mm -hmm. and because of the book and what it's done for me. So it's a very, very strange thing. So I'm going to tell you, writing yeah. a book, is very revealing as to how and who you are. Yeah. But it's also very shocking as to what it can do. And you've just said it. That mm -hmm. book came out three years ago. Yeah. And it's still making impact. Um, now, you've, throughout your experience, you've been featured in over 30, 30 TV shows. How do you feel about being on TV? I don't care. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people get scared. They get nervous. Mm -hmm. But on all the shows, I turn up with a T-shirt and jean, yeah. uh, jeans, and I'm like, hey, how you doing? You know, and I'm, and I'm there. Yeah. Um, I, I think life's a journey, and mm -hmm. I want to have some smiles. If it caused me, caused me any aggravation, if mm -hmm. I had to pay to be on TV, if I had to do something to be on TV, mm -hmm. and it caused me some kind of anguish, mm -hmm. I wouldn't do it. Yeah. So... You know, I want to do these things because I find them interesting. I find them funny. I find them amusing. But then the beautiful thing is once I've done it, I can then go to my coaching clients yep. and teach them how to do it. Yeah. So I've been on a lot of TV shows. I've also not been on a lot of TV shows. Yeah. Because shows that want me to be on there that aren't the right fit to my message. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not the kind of people that I want to hang out with. Yep. So my brand is strong because it's never, ever, ever been diluted. It's 110% mm -hmm. and it's great. If you don't like that, great. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that I am completely impossible to misunderstand. And mm -hmm. that's why you've got to be really careful where you go and what you do and who you speak to. Uh, so you've recently got your American citizenship. Can you take me through the process to get your citizenship and what that was like for you and how long it actually took you um, to complete and get your Amer be an American citizen? So if anyone hasn't worked out yet, I'm British. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I've been in America for 21 years. Mm -hmm. And one of my clients who I coach is an immigration attorney. Yep. So last year he said to me, hey, the laws are changing in December. Mm -hmm. You may want to try and get your application in before then, um, just in case. Yeah. You can always refuse it. You can always decline it. But I suggest you try. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, okay. So we applied. Um, the application wasn't a lot because we already had our green card. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then it was, uh, God, what was it, a month ago? Um, so three months ago, we get a letter going, hey, you've got to go to this office. Mm -hmm. You've got to answer these questions uh, within your process for citizenship. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, they gave you a link to like these hundred questions that mm -hmm. out of these hundred questions, they were going to ask you six. Oh, wow. And if you didn't get those six right, they would ask you another four mm -hmm. so that you got six out of ten. Yeah. Uh, but it was these hundred questions. And the funny thing was, I was talking to my um, American friends and mm -hmm. I was saying to them, um, you know, what's famous about Jack? Jefferson, you know, mm -hmm. or you know, name name the states, mm -hmm. or uh, or or name you know what was the Civil War about, or you know what was Independence. Yeah, a lot of my American friends were going, I don't know, you know, <laughs> um, but I had to practice these and practice these and practice these, mm -hmm. and um, then I got to the uh, I got to the uh, government uh, building. Mm -hmm. and they asked me six questions and I got them all right and they went oh congratulations so in the room I was mm -hmm. there 10 minutes yeah you know? <laughs> so, and then they went well take this letter step outside they're mm -hmm. gonna swear you in mm -hmm. and I'm gonna I was like what and you see the movies where you go down to a room and there's 30 other people with you and you pledge allegiance yeah, you get a certificate and there's a big ceremony. Well, I'm in COVID, so <laughs> yeah. they literally walked us out into the car park, and there's ten other people, mm -hmm. and they gave us a little piece of paper. They quickly read it because it's in sun, you know, mm -hmm. and we're all getting yeah, and, and it's hot. Um, congratulations! Here's your certificate. Any questions? Contact. Bye bye. And that was it. So it was really, really quick um, to get it done. But now I go for my passport mm -hmm. in May. Um, but I, I am officially an American citizen. In fact, I'm dual nationality. I'm British and American now. So mm -hmm. it's pretty cool. Uh, your current project is an app called Taste of Blue. Can you tell the listeners a bit more about that? So Taste of Blue is a, is a company that I'm helping marketing. It's actually a... Uh, um, a travel company, which let's be blunt, during COVID is terrible. So my real focus is in um, helping entrepreneurs become better, which is Sims Distillery. Yeah. That's the people with at the moment, because quite simply, there's no point focusing on a travel company when no one can travel. Yeah. Um, so who, have, from your perspective, are um, the best clients who you've worked with? Clients that have aggravated, mm -hmm. you know, people that think they know everything mm -hmm. are always very, very difficult people to deal with. Yeah. Okay. I like dealing with people that are annoyed, mm -hmm. that are angry, that want to do something better. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they don't understand why they can't be doing this. And they, they can't understand why their marketing not, not work. Those, those clients are good. Those aggravated mm -hmm. clients are my best clients. Have there been any circumstances where events haven't gone to plan and you've still been able to pull it off? Oh, millions of times. Mm -hmm. um, you see, the beautiful thing is when a client asks you, mm -hmm. okay, listen to what the client is asking you for and yeah. then give them more, mm -hmm. okay? So if a client wants to do something here, how crazy can you make that? Yeah. How wonderful. Now, you may come up with this amazing idea that either can't be done mm -hmm. or the client can't afford. Mm -hmm. But then you will lower it and lower it and lower it and lower it until you meet a level field mm -hmm. that is still far above what the client originally asked you for. You see, the thing is, have you ever smacked your thumb or caught it in a drawer or, yeah, yeah. But you've done that, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And you're young. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> Did it hurt? 100% it hurt. <laughs> okay. Do you avoid doing those things now because of the pain you went through? Yes, exactly. You try to okay. avoid it as much as you can. 
Okay. But, but, if, but if it's something like business and you've gone through pain, you've got to try and overcome that fear and that pain. Bingo, my boy. Overcome the fear of that mm-hmm. pain. Now, you said you've hurt your thumb. Yeah. Okay. Can you remember the exact feeling that you actually had? Or can you remember more the fear that it gave you? Probably the fear that it gave me of doing it again. If we could remember pain as human beings, Mm -hmm. women would never have a second child. Yeah. (laughs) We wouldn't do it. You see, something happens about our mind Mm -hmm. in the fact that we forget fear. Yeah, we rem- we remember the uh, the emotion, and that emotion is the fear that we had. Yeah, yeah, but you actually can't remember the exact emotion of banging your thumb, yeah. or or clipping your finger, or trapping your foot somewhere. Mm-hmm. You can't actually remember it because your body says, "If we hang on to that emotion, we'll never do anything again." Yeah. So we we know we don't like it. We remember the fear. We know in our mind, oh, my God, we don't like that because that mm-hmm. hurt. Yeah. But you physically can't remember the pain that you were actually in at that mm-hmm. moment, okay? Yeah. That's the same thing with a no. When I'm trying to do someone and someone says, no, you can't do that, You're gonna I do go, it. oh, well, how can I do it? Yeah. You know? And I keep going forward. I always believe if someone says no to me, I ask the wrong person or the wrong question. Yeah. Don't stop. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, I've got turned down a lot of times. Mm-hmm. I've got declined. If I could tell you a hundred times that I've mm-hmm. been declined, yeah, maybe there's a million. <laughs> just like you banging your thumb, mm-hmm. you know it happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can't really remember it. Mm-hmm. So you keep going. Yeah. Okay. And that's what I do. I get turned down a lot. I just don't care. I -hmm. keep going until I achieve. And do you know the funny thing is, when you start achieving great things, great things start happening for you. Yeah. Now, I want to get into like TV, radio, um, and cover sports worldwide. Have you got any any advice or any contacts that could help me get there sooner? Get you onto TV? Yeah, or radio or things like that, yeah. Well, for a start, stop doing a turkey shoot. Yeah. Okay. People sit there and go, oh, could you help me get, you know, TV, podcasts, uh, media, yeah. you know, radio. Pick one. Yeah. Okay. Pick the one that's going to work best for you. See, mm-hmm. here's, here's a strange thing. Okay. If I go on TV mm-hmm. tomorrow, that by millions of people. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's say, for argument's sake, tomorrow I go on Good Morning America. Yeah. And I'm on the prime spot at 8 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And there will be some statistics out there to show how many people were watching that show at 8 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. You'd be impressed. Yeah. You know, oh, you on Good Morning America. 10 million people watched you on Good Morning America. Good for you. Yeah. Okay. How can I retarget them? Mm -hmm. You can't. Yeah. Okay. But if I went on someone's podcast, like Max, Mm -hmm. I can see how many comments were made on Max's Facebook page. Yeah. I can see how many people downloaded and who downloaded Mm -hmm. that episode. Mm -hmm. I can see how many people have tagged me in the conversation with Max. Yeah. I'm in control of my retargeting. Mm -hmm. Too many people go big game hunting. Mm -hmm. And they turn around and they go, I want to be on TV. Mm -hmm. Do you know you can do more damage being someone's YouTube channel? Mm -hmm. You can have more control being on someone's Instagram live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the first thing you need to do is focus on what, and you said to me earlier, Steve, you've been on a lot of podcasts. Yeah. Okay. Focus on the platform that can move the needle best for you. Yeah. 
So before you say to me, hey, Steve, you can do all of these things. Yeah, yeah I can, Max. Mm -hmm. But are they the best thing for you? That's your mm -hmm. first question. Yeah. What will move the needle best for you? Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Steve, for uh, coming on the podcast today and coming on to have a chat and putting aside sort of an hour or so of your time. Um, it's been an absolute honour to have you on, like I mentioned before. And, um, yeah, we'll speak soon. Hey, you, Max. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Steve. Stay tuned, everyone, for some more Sporting Max.